Let's go to our God. We'll just briefly, a word of prayer, ask in his time, uh, blessing us in our time here today. Dear Lord God, we thank you for giving us your word in the Bible and for your Holy Spirit to open up our hearts to see who you really are. Our loving Father, our tender, compassionate Father, who's done everything so that we could have a relationship with you. Help us today to, to love the truth, to cherish the truth, and to want to share the truth with others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Bless our time here today. Amen. Hmm. Open wide. Open wide. You know, we sometimes as parents would say, I can remember saying, open wide as we would try and shovel a spoonful of something like strained peas into our toddler's mouth, right? Open wide, the dentist says, as you wonder, how's that drill going to feel here, right? Open wide is one of those kind of things that, you know, makes you perhaps almost reflexively want to say, oh, wait, no, open wide, nope, uh, close up shop here, turn away. <laughs> you know, I'd run if I could get out of this chair. Open wide. It's almost as if we, we learn from an early age in life to be instinctively a little hesitant when somebody says, open wide. It's no wonder, o opening up in life. It's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? And if it's hard to do sometimes when it comes to what we put in our mouths, how much harder or how much more difficult when it comes to what goes into our hearts, right? You think about how hard it can be sometimes. We, we don't always like to just open up our hearts, right? And, and I think I know a couple reasons why, maybe. Perhaps fear of getting hurt, right? Fear of pain, fear of being manipulated, being fooled, being tricked. Right? We've trusted, and maybe we got burned before, so why let that happen again, right? Our hearts. Oh. Some of us, we, we guard our hearts carefully, don't we? Many of us have, have learned by experience in life uh, what the Bible says in this proverb in the Old Testament, this wisdom from God where he says to us, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. We learn to guard our hearts. However, today, the Apostle Paul, we're going to hear him tell the Corinthians to open wide your hearts. Right? He, he says to them, open wide. So let's take a look at what Paul means when he encourages them and also us to open wide our hearts. We're going to see today from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 11. And then Pastor Joel, next week when he comes back, he's going to have the fun of kind of uh, showing the verses that come before this. Just some beautiful promises of God. But here we are today in verse 11. He, Paul writes, he says, We, we, we uh, apostles, we servants of the Lord, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts also. So there it is. He says, open wide your heart. Which sounds a little bit dangerous, doesn't it? Like parents, you know, you just don't want to hand your kid an iPad with unfettered access, unlimited data plan, and just say to your kid, son, open wide your heart to whatever you see on the internet. Right? Follow your heart wherever it leads, wherever the algorithms want to take you. Open wide your heart. Like, that, that's kind of a risky venture, right? If you think about it, like, the whole internet, all of humanity, all of what this world has to, to, to share, right? But, but here in this letter, in 2 Corinthians, what's going on here in the Bible is that the Corinthians themselves are actually in serious danger of that kind of thing happening to them, and that's why the Apostle Paul is telling them, you guys, open wide your hearts. But what he's going to say, and this is what we're going to see, he's saying, open wide your hearts to me, 
as your pastor, as an authentic apostle sent by Jesus Christ. Paul's letting them know that, that he's somebody who really cares about them, and, and he sees that they're actually in great danger. They don't see it yet, but Paul wants them to see, you guys are in great danger. And so again, he says, we've spoken freely to you, Corinthians. In other words, uh, we, we haven't been holding our affection from you, right? We haven't been hiding anything from you. There's no ulterior motives here. We've opened wide our hearts to you. He says, but you're withholding yours from us. So as a fair exchange, I speak as to my children. Open wide your hearts also. Okay, so we kind of got to remember what's going on here in 2 Corinthians. Like, like Paul was, he'd been their first pastor. Paul like started the Christian church there in Corinth. Right? So he was, in a sense, their spiritual father. He was the one that God used to first introduce them to Jesus as their savior from sin. Paul had always been up front and just honest and sincere about who Jesus is and what Jesus had done. He talked about their, you know, Jesus' death and resurrection. He, he wanted them to be 100% confident that when they would die, they could go to heaven because of Jesus. Paul didn't stop there. He wanted them to see the spiritual gifts that God had given to them so that they could be you know, saved to serve, you know, and to, to use their gifts to, to serve others and to share the message of, of the gospel with others. But what's been happening is, like, their hearts are getting all cluttered. And they're, they're pouring in all this other content that's, like, pushing out the truth of Jesus. So it's interesting. When, when Paul says, you're withholding your affection from us, um, in, the, in the Greek language of the New Testament there, it literally, he says, your hearts are being crowded. I think that's a powerful picture, you know? Your hearts are being crowded. Your soul is just getting cluttered with all this stuff. So here's what had been going on, right? Like these other teachers came to town. They were flashy. They had charisma. Uh, they had captivating personalities and, and that kind of a thing. They, they flaunted their credentials, and they pointed their popularity. And, and the Corinthians were, were buying what they were selling, Right? These other guys, uh, they're coming in and they're saying, you know, you really, you guys, you should really be listening to us and not so much to that guy Paul. Like, that old pastor Paul, he's old news, you know. What you really need is us new super apostles. It's kind of what they were being called. Right? So the thing, that, when Paul was getting crowded out of their hearts, what was happening is that the gospel of Jesus that Paul preached to them was also getting crowded out of their hearts. So they had, they had gone all in, the Corinthians, in embracing these new super apostles. And so Paul was kind of getting squeezed out. Now I know, maybe you think you're, you're to yourself a little bit like, well, who, really, you know, who cares about the Corinthians? Right? And what does it have to do with me? What does it have to do with us today? Well, here's the thing, right? Like we, uh, we can be so concerned about our physical health, right? Like, haven't the last couple of months just, like, shown us, like, we will, we will do anything to protect our physical health? And, like, if you know, if you have a family history of heart disease or heart issues, like, then you're, you, you get super cautious about, about your physical heart, right? You start learning about the good cholesterol you want and the bad cholesterol you don't want, Right, you start, you know, thinking about, like, well, I'm going to eat that kind of fish that's got the good fatty acids or taking omega-3 supplements and, like, all that stuff. Whatever means I might have a better heart, right? And it makes sense. Like, if, if, you know, you want to have a healthy heart. Like, if your heart stops, that's it, right? But here's the thing. God, God wants you to have concern for, for your physical body. But he also wants you to be of the utmost concern even more for your spiritual health, too, your, your, your soul, right? The wellspring of, of your heart, right? And so if you think about it, what goes into our hearts? What goes into our souls? Like what you, what you read and what you watch and the content that you consume and who you follow and, and are influenced by and the church that you go to, even all these things, they, they impact your heart. 
you know, and like, like bad cholesterol or uh, poison, you know, Mr. Yuck sticker kind of stuff. Like if, if you don't see that's what it is, that, that's going to have an impact on your heart. It might even damage or poison or kill your heart, your soul. So when Paul says, open wide your hearts, you guys, what he's trying to help them do is, is to, to see like what you need to clear out your heart, unclutter your heart, spring clean your heart, and make room for the true word of God as it is faithfully taught and applied in your life. Make time for reading and studying the Bible with others so that you can, you can learn and see how God's will applies to your daily life. Make the time to, to gather with others who love the truth of God's word weekly in, in worship like this and throughout the week in, in a connect group. Don't just, don't just let the, uh, the busyness of life, don't just let other things crowd all that out from your heart. Don't just let the, the algorithms on social media and influencers out there fill your heart with whatever they want. Don't just let the world uh, pour in only those parts of the Bible that you find match up with your feelings already. Right? Don't just fall for any worldly ideology out there that wants to have like this totalizing control over all of your life. Make room in your heart for the truth of God's word and let that shape your thinking and your actions. I saw a question online this week, a question that got me thinking as I was preparing this message. The, the question is this. Is what is important to God still important to us? Is what's important to God still important to us? And I think there's two things that kind of jumped out at me that really stood out as I was studying this text, this, you know, middle of 2 Corinthians, like here we are, but in the context of it all, I think there's two things that stood out to me. What matters to God here that we see are, are two things, faithfulness to the truth and faithfulness with the truth. They both go hand in hand, faithfulness to the truth of God's word and faithfulness with the truth of God's word. In other words, holding on to the truth and then holding it out to other people so that they could see the truth of God's word too, not just keeping it to ourselves. So holding to the truth, that's not always easy to do because the, the truth is like we, we need God's truth in our lives because we're always more inclined to opening up our hearts to the wrong things, the wrong people, the wrong influences, right? It's like our natural default setting to not hold as important what God considers important. There's this verse from the prophet Jeremiah that's very insightful about this. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Right? Like, so today, and I don't, I don't want to just paint with too broad of a brush, but there are, there are lots of churches out there that are extremely popular with a celebrity pastor, and they've got a great show that they put on and they figured out how to tailor the message just exactly to the, the mood and the feelings of the time so that people hear what they want to hear, and it grows like crazy. Right? But then the ministry crumbles as a result of a scandal. And you see, you've seen this happening time and again. It's, it's heartbreaking. And in so many churches, this, they've, got, they've gone down this path of progressive theology of the Bible, downplaying all of God's truth so that nobody ever feels uncomfortable in their lifestyle anymore. Because it's as if it's all good. As long as you feel good, God's going to be good. And that's it's a really dangerous path to follow, to let your heart follow. Right? And so that's why the Apostle Paul is telling the Corinthians here, guys, open up your hearts to me. Now, that's not just an ego trip there. I know that sounds kind of weird at first. Like, stop listening to all these other voices and listen to me, right? But what Paul's trying to do is he's trying to remind them that it, that it was through his ministry as, as, an, as an apostle of Jesus, sent by Jesus, that the Corinthians first learned to know the gospel of God's grace. He's trying to remind them that it was through his preaching that they got to know who God actually truly is. 
and not, not just as like the, the all-powerful creator of heaven and earth, but, but as the tender, compassionate father who loves them and who wants to have a relationship with them and who's done everything to bring them back to him through Jesus, his son. So Paul's reminding them it was, it was through his ministry of the gospel that they got to know the beauty of, of Jesus and all that he's done for them. Like the beating heart of all Paul's ministry was Jesus. But, but, but not, just G, not just like generic Jesus, right? Not just Jesus as this good example to follow, be like Jesus, as if that's all Christianity is. Not, not just uh, like Jesus as your life coach either. You know what I mean? Like, like Jesus, he's there to affirm whatever decisions you want to make in life, tell you, you know what, you can do it. If it feels good, go for it. You've got the power within you. That's not the biblical Jesus. Paul's message was all about uh, the, Jesus, but not the way he's kind of being remade or refashioned today as kind of a, a modern social justice warrior Jesus. But the Jesus that... The Bible presents to us the way that he wants to be received by us, and that is as the one who came and made an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world, for you and for me and for every single person on this planet because he loves you. He loves you. He loves with the same kind of unconditional, right, all in, non-discriminating, undying love. And so now he, he calls us who follow him to daily take up our cross, to follow him, right? And even when it's hard, and even when we might face persecution, because what did he do? He, he died for us. He, he died for our, our sinful, proud, arrogant, foolish, naive hearts, so that by faith in him we might live forever with him in heaven. He came to bring us the true spiritual healing that nothing in this world can ultimately give us. For all the brokenness and all the heartache and all the hurt that people experience when they just follow their heart and it leads to slavery to sin or brokenness, Jesus came to bind up and to heal through the gospel. And that's why, that's why we need and want to hear what God considers important. You know, if you think about like, these, these, uh, these new teachers that came to Corinth— and uh, you know, they're the super apostles, like, you know. And uh, the thing is, they didn't just show up and be like, we are here in opposition to the gospel of Jesus. And they didn't, they didn't come in and they just say, we are here to pull you away from the truth of the gospel. They didn't do that. But listen to how Paul, like, encourages the Corinthians to deal with these guys. Like, this is... This is pretty strong language. Later on in the letter, here's what he says about these so-called super apostles. In chapter 11, he says, For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising, then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. That's pretty harsh, right? But they, did these super apostles look good and sound good? Were they popular? Yeah. They looked good. They sounded good. They had a popular message. People kind of flocked to that message. But, but what he's saying is you can look good, you can sound good, you can be popular and not be good at all if... if you're not also faithful to God and his word. So how, how are we supposed to deal with people like that? What are we supposed to do when we're confronted with some teaching or, or some church or just some media personality that does not hold to a biblical Christian worldview and is trying to change our hearts and get in there and clutter out the truth? What do we, what do, we do? Here's, here's what Paul says. This is encouragement to all God's people. He goes on in chapter 6, verse 14, so we kind of pick up there where we left off at the beginning. And this is what he says. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? 
Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial, which is another name for, for Satan? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, quote, I will live with them and walk with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, Paul doesn't question the sincerity of these super apostles. He, he doesn't uh, question their abilities, you know, whether they're really gifted or not, powerful speakers or not. He doesn't even challenge whether or not they're likable people, you know. But because they were teaching a polluted gospel, and not the pure gospel of Jesus, his advice here is that like, you should just stay away. Avoid them like the plague. This isn't going to help you grow. This is going to only destroy your heart. And it makes you think. It's a humbling thing. How many people out there who, whether they call themselves Lutherans or Christians or whatever, how many preachers are really making it their goal to stay faithful to the Lord Jesus. And I say that knowing that means I need to look daily into the mirror of humility and I invite feedback from God's people to make sure that, that I'm staying faithful to God's word in the scriptures because these, these Corinthians, they, they were captivated by this stuff. I'm sure they didn't want to hear Paul tell them this. Can't we just have a sermon that tells us that it's all good, like life is tough and so are you. Now go out there and do it. Like, but instead he's dealing with the sin problem in their hearts. And it just shows you, I think, that our sinful nature, right? It, it, our heart, which is so de deceptive, right? Our sinful nature would always rather hear a message that just says, you know, everything's good. You're good. Do whatever feels good. Believe whatever you want. Pick and choose a church on the basis of what you like about that preacher or don't like or that band or whatever. Like, like, that's where our heart wants to go. But it kind of goes back to that question that we had before, right? Is what is important to God still important to us? Because today God's word says that there can be no compromise between light and darkness. Right? He says there can be no compromise between the, the truth of Jesus in the, in the word and the lies of Satan. Right? So, so as for you, he, say, he says, open wide your heart's to the truth. In other words, make room in your heart for what is important to God. Maybe that means you need to take a little inventory of your heart today. You know, say, what, what is really important to me? Are my, have my priorities gotten out of line with God's word? Right, to make room for what's important in your heart for God. Now, today is kind of a fun opportunity for me today. Like, I, I love getting to come here and visit y'all and, you know, be a guest preacher. Like, that's always kind of a, a fun thing. Pastor Joel's out of town, and I know how it is. Like, my people are the same way. Like, they hear me week after week after week. And it's always kind of nice to have, you know, someone new and novel come in and, and preach. Um, and it's fun to be with a group of people. But I think that, you know, in, in light of what God's Word is saying here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, there's a few things I'd like to, to share with you all today about Pastor Joel. Um, I just have just tremendous respect for Pastor Joel. He's a guy who's he's dedicated his life to helping people like you learn the truth about God's word and, and apply it in your life and use your gift to be, to, to be on the greater mission that Jesus has called us to be on, right? That's sometimes hard because he'll, he'll point out, he'll, he, he won't hold back from preaching the law, right? He'll point out the clutter in your heart and the obstacles, and he'll say, repent. Right? But he also won't hold back from sharing with you the, the message of the gospel, the news that can heal your heart. All that Jesus has done, right? I, I respect Pastor Joel because I know he's a super, super hard worker. Like, he sets the bar on that, you know? 
And, and he's been faithful over the long haul of his ministry, both, both to the Word of God and also with the Word of God and wanting to share it, not, not only here in Delray Beach, Florida, but also where he was in Toronto, Canada. Right? Now, does this mean he's one of the flashiest preachers that you've ever seen on TikTok? I mean, I wouldn't even know. I'm not even on TikTok, but I, 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 the kids say, don't, don't, don't even try that, Pastor Ben. No, you know. <laughs> but there's guys on TikTok, Christian preachers with over a million followers. God bless them. That's awesome. You know? Now, I don't know, you know, what you think is the, the flashiest sermon or the most catching kind of thing, but I do know this about Pastor Joel. Um, I know that he'd rather have you go home on a Sunday saying, wow. What a wonderful Savior we have. Then saying, wow, what a great show we got today. Right? I know he does his best. Everybody here is doing their best. And that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing, using our gifts to serve as best we can. But at the end of the day, none of us is Jesus. Right? And we just want like jars of clay and all that we can do to let the treasure of Jesus shine. Right? Because Pastor Joel knows the same thing that I do. Like, there's a lot of places that you could go to hear exactly what you want to hear. Just shop around, right? That's what people do. There's a lot of places where you can go for the show if that's what you want. And I think how much more in South Florida, like, for whatever reason, this is the place where the show matters, seems to matter more to people than anywhere else. Like, the outward stuff when really God's always aiming for the heart, isn't he? So today, I just, I, you know, it's just appropriate. Like, God put it on my heart, and I think from his word here today, to just, like, apply to you the, the same words that the Apostle Paul wants to apply to the Corinthians. Like, apply this to your pastor. Here's that little verse where, where Paul says, Let's, uh, as a fair exchange, see that little verse? He says, as a fair exchange, open wide your hearts also. Okay? Open wide your hearts also. Embrace your pastor as a faithful servant of the Lord, right? Just ask yourself, have you been, have you been comparing himself to other people and holding them to a different standard? Or have you, have you been holding back? Just, you're together in Christ, right? So one last thing. We can put that final verse up on the screen here because this, this last verse, this uh, first verse of chapter 7 actually is kind of like the closing thought to the section. So we're almost done. Here's what Paul says. Here's what he says. Since we have these promises, dear friends. Isn't that cool? Since we have these promises, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Right? I think this is really cool because you notice something? He, he doesn't say, since we have these threats, you better do what Pastor Ben's telling you to do today. Right? I don't have that power. I don't come in here to say, here's my threat. Like, that's just cool. It's since we have these threats, like, that would change everything, right? But instead it says, since we have these promises. We, the people of God, have these promises of the gospel in Jesus Christ. And that changes everything. It really does. That means living the Christian life isn't just about having the right information but also about having the right motivation, having our hearts made right, right? We, we don't just do what God wants us to do out of fear, as if we better do it or else, or because somebody says so or whatever. Like, we do what God wants us to do out of a profound sense of gratitude for Jesus and, and what he's done and all that he wants to continue to do through his word in us. And that changes everything. We have these promises, after all. Promises that have been guaranteed to us through the gospel of Jesus. So open wide. You know, finally, that's what God's going to do for each of you who trust in Jesus. When he swings wide open the gates of heaven to you. Right? Not because any of us are worthy, but because of his mercy. God will say, open wide. Come on in. Right? Jesus has removed all the barriers. He's taken away all our fears. And he's replaced them instead with God's unconditional love and grace. So friends, lo love God's word. Cherish the truth. 
and open wide your heart to the truth. Amen. And the peace of God that surpasses all our human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Until one day, we don't have to live by faith anymore, but we will see you by sight in heaven.